Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we are going to discuss post-operative care. The aim of post-operative care is to provide the patient with a quick, painless and safe recovery. And to make that happen, you must have appropriate knowledge and skills to manage any kind of complications which may arise post-operatively. In this video, we are going to discuss some common post-operative complications and how to deal with them. Which will be complications associated with the monitoring system like air embolism, phlebitis, finger necrosis and shortness of breath, deep vein thrombosis, nausea and vomiting, urinary complications, complications after abdominal surgery, fever and wound dehiscence. Let's start with complications associated with monitoring system. First is air embolism. It is a pathological condition caused by air or gas bubbles in the vascular system. It can occur when more than 15 ml of air is accidentally introduced during or after insertion of a venous catheter. This air can travel through veins into the right atrium and can prevent the right heart filling resulting in drop in blood pressure, rise in pulse rate and distension of jugular vein with a rise in JVP. So if you are suspecting air embolism then immediate management will be to place the patient in a head down or Trendelenburg position. This will encourage the air to float into the veins of the lower part of the body and also place the patient on the left side. This will prevent the air from entering into the pulmonary arteries. And in extreme cases, air may be aspirated from the heart through a needle introduced below the left costal margin. To avoid this complication in the first place, run fluids through the giving sets before connecting them to patient. And when placing the catheter in a vein, patient should be placed in the Trendelenburg position. This will raise the central venous pressure and prevent the air from entering inside. Next is phlebitis, which refers to inflammation of a vein. It can occur due to insertion of a needle or an intravenous catheter. There are various factors responsible for this inflammation like mechanical trauma to a vein, chemical reaction to a drug or fluid being infused, or due to bacterial accumulation. The incidence of phlebitis can be reduced by simple measures like good practice during insertion, good infection control techniques, and it is also recommended that cannula are marked with the date of insertion and changed at 72 hours. Finger necrosis is another complication associated with monitoring system. It can result from arterial line insertion into radial or femoral artery. In a normal individual, the hand is supplied by blood from both the ulnar and radial arteries. But a minority of people lack this dual blood supply and their hand is predominantly supplied by the radial artery. So in such individuals, radial artery cannulation may disrupt the blood supply to the hand, causing ischemic necrosis of the finger. In view of this, it is important to check the patency of both arteries using Ellen's test before inserting an arterial line. Now moving on to next complication which is shortness of breath. It is a frequently encountered post-operative complication and in order to accurately identify the etiology, the clinician must rely on a thorough history and physical exam along with the required investigations. Its causes can be myocardial infarction and heart failure, pulmonary embolism, chest infection and exacerbation of asthma or COPD. Appropriate investigations will be full blood count and arterial blood gases, urea, creatinine and electrolytes, cardiac enzymes and ECG, and chest x-ray. Treatment options are oxygen therapy, intravenous excess, physiotherapy, and medical treatment according to the cause. Next is deep vein thrombosis or DVD. It occurs when a blood clot forms in a vein deep in the body. Mostly it occurs in lower leg or thigh. It can develop in patients older than 60 years of age in case of a recent surgery due to prolonged immobilization like bed rest as a result of trauma, oral contraceptive pills, obesity and heart failure also increase the risk of DVT. Mostly it doesn't cause any symptoms but when it does it can cause calf pain, swelling, warmth, redness and engorged veins. Muscle may be tender on palpation and human sign. 
which is discomfort or pain behind the knee in the calf muscles upon dorsiflexion of the foot. It can be prevented by early mobilization, hydration, compression stockings. They prevent venous stasis. Low molecular weight apparent prophylaxis, which prevents clotting and calf pumps. It is a common exercise and it is advised to patients who are bedridden for prolonged periods and also minimize the use of tourniquets as it can increase the risk of DVT. If a significant DVT is formed, it can be treated with parenteral anticoagulation initially, followed by long-term warfarin or new oral anticoagulants. Now for nausea and vomiting, the predisposing factors are poorly controlled pain, use of opioids, surgery on gastrointestinal tract and orthopedic surgery, female gender and young adults. Treatment involves general measures and drug therapy. In general measures, regional anesthesia should be used instead of general anesthesia whenever possible. Adequate pain control should be given. Opioids should be avoided. Instead, NSAIDs and regional anesthesia can be used. Stomach should be kept empty. Start oral feeding slowly and maintain hydration and blood pressure with fluids such as crystalloids or colloids. Drug therapy includes dopamine receptor antagonists like prochlorperazine, metoclopramide, H1 receptor antagonists like cyclozine, and 5-HG receptor antagonists like ondansetron. Now moving on to urinary complications. Oliguria is a common complication in the post-operative period. It is defined as urine output less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. It is most commonly caused by reduced renal perfusion resulting from perioperative hypotension or inadequate fluid replacement. And if it is left untreated, it may cause acute renal failure. Some common causes of acute renal failure are hypotension, hypovolemia, nephrotoxic drugs, steroids, and uretric injury. So urinary complications can be prevented by monitoring renal function, assessing volume status, by monitoring pulse and BP, serial body weight, central venous pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Nephrotoxic drugs should also be avoided. Sepsis should be prevented by catheter care or antibiotic administration. And in case of urinary retention, diuretics can be helpful. After abdominal surgery, the main complications to look out for in a patient are anastomotic leakage, which is a leak of luminal contents from a surgical joint. And any patient who is not progressing as expected or who deteriorated after GI surgery should be considered to have an anastomotic leak until proven otherwise. Bleeding may also be a complication. Localized infection like an abscess may occur, presenting with persistent abdominal pain, focal tenderness, and a spiking fever. But if the abscess is deep-seated, these symptoms may be absent and the patient will show neutrophilic leukocytosis with positive blood culture. So an ultrasound or a CT will be needed to confirm the abscess. Paralytic ileus may also occur, which is obstruction of intestine due to paralysis of intestinal muscles. Treatment is usually supportive with the maintenance of hydration and electrolyte levels. However, the complication may persist, so it should be actively sought and treated. Next complication is fever. It develops in 40% of patients after major surgery, among which 80% have no particular cause. The causes include atelectasis, superficial and deep wound infection, chest infection, UTI, thrombophlebitis, wound infection, anastomotic leakage, and abscess. And possible causes of pyrexia of a non-infective origin are DVT, transfusion reactions, wound hematomas, atelectasis, and drug reactions. Finally, wound dehiscence. It refers to partial or complete disruption of any or all of the layers in a wound. It most commonly occurs from the 5th to the 8th post-operative day when the strength of the wound is at its weakest. It most commonly occurs in the abdominal wounds and usually presents with a cirrhosis and guinness discharge. For the management, most patients will need to return to the operating theater for re-suturing and in some cases it may be appropriate to leave the wound open and treat with dressings or vacuum assisted closure pumps. This will allow the wound to close by secondary intention. 
this was everything about post operative care i hope you like the video thank you for watching